Okie dokie. So I'm delighted to say coming up next is a person I think a lot of you might know a bit about, but we're going to delve deep and find out all of her secrets. No, we're not. We're going to talk about Silverstone and find out a few secrets. It's Abby Eaton. Abby, um, thank you so much for coming on to the Silverstone podcast. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, and I guess your association with Silverstone has been fairly long. Um, yeah, so I kind of got my arts license from Silverstone in 2011. Um, but I think I actually ended up raced in my first race there at, uh, I think it must have been 2005, 2006, something like that. Um, but yeah, in terms of actually working for Silverstone, 2011 was when I started there. So take me back even further than working there. So you said about going there and racing. What's your first memory of Silverstone? Um, actually, even before then was my dad's racing. Um, so I remember... I was probably six or seven and um, they were racing on the national circuit so my first memory of Silverstone is probably on my bike doing tricks around the paddock and, and making a nuisance of myself probably um, and then yeah from there uh, when I moved into cars and, and started racing in cars um, it will have been the national again so actually only my first time um, on the GT circuit on the, the full uh, F1 circuit was actually um, working as an instructor. Wowzers, that's amazing. Okay, so I want to know more a little bit about your dad and the connection you have with motorsport because of your father. Yeah, so my dad is a petrol head, like all the best people. Um, he started off racing bikes and then moved into carts and then uh, eventually into cars. So um, I've been brought up around motorsport. It's kind of what I, I live and, and breathe and, you know, experience every day of my life. And, you know, when I was a, a kid watching my dad at, at the race circuits and, you know, being a what I call a hero you know he was my hero watching him you know come back in with these massive trophies that were the size of me um and it was just something that I'd always wanted to have a go at and you know when I was I think eight eight years old I can ask my dad look I really want to go karting can I can I do this is this possible for me and he's like yeah yeah of course it is but I'm just you know we'll see we'll see because he was in the middle of a you know a quite a big sponsorship deal for his racing um and after a couple of years of pestering and it kind of just timed right that when his sponsorship deal came to an end, um, I was there tugging on his trousers saying, right, my turn. Um, so, yeah, then he got me a go-kart when I was 10 and then we're 18 years on from then now. Wow, so it's, it's certainly been, um, I think, a very dedicated journey that you've had with motorsport in general. And with your dad having started in bikes and then gone to cars and then um, carts and then cars, do you think that as well as kind of uh, has molded your career in, in the fact that you have got different helmets, so to speak, and you wear them well? Um, well, to be honest, my dad was very much against me going anywhere near a bike. Um, he actually ended up having a crash on one of his bikes. So he did speedway stuff. So, you know, all the sideways um, on loose surface with a bike which I don't know how he managed to do fair play um, but yeah he had a, a crash on one of them and he ended up going to hospital and um, they did a scan on him and found out that he actually was only born with one kidney and he didn't didn't know that no one knew that even you know my grandma didn't realize so he obviously you're very very vulnerable on a bike so he was like right I need to go and do something a little bit safer which is why he went over to four wheels um, and I think because of his experiences on how vulnerable you are on a bike, he didn't want his little girl, you know, putting herself in danger. So I think actually before I started um, in, a, in a cart, I wanted to go biking because I was always every Christmas I'd have a bike for Christmas um, and I'd be doing stupid jumps and tricks and I'd fall off it, get back on. And, you know, I was just absolutely bike mad. Um, so he kind of squashed that pretty quickly and and said look if you're going to do anything it's going to have four wheels um so yeah just recently I've, I've kind of crossed over to the bike world very slightly and um there's always stern um words of you know be careful look after yourself you know I know that you might be in control but you know other people so yeah typical dad really <laughs> when you say typical dad um I mean fathers are always going to be the way they they are 
But as a girl, did you feel that that relationship was different to everybody else you were around? Because you must have been a proper daddy's girl to a point. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think maybe as I get older, it's maybe changing a bit. I don't know. I'm always going to be a daddy's girl. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it was, you know, I was a real tomboy, you know, still am. But it would be, I'd spend every evening with my dad in the garage. Um, You know, mum would be sat inside watching TV and I'd be out in the freezing cold in this garage. And um, on the right hand side of my dad's garage, he had a worktop with a vice in it. And I would sit up there. I've got a, a a stool that I'd sit on and I would put stuff in the vice and I'd like saw it and I'd like attach things to it and stuff while my dad was working on his car his race car you know behind me um so yeah I just I just wanted to be out with my dad mucking about and getting involved and um yeah I think definitely I'm a a daddy's girl (laughs) and when did that crossover happen between knowing it was something you loved and enjoying sort of tinkering about in the garage to actually thinking right I, this is what I want to do. This is serious now. Um, it probably didn't really hit me until I got into a car. Um, you know, karting for me is, it's fantastic. And I think everyone from a, a young age, if you can, you've got to do some karting. You've got to do years of karting because you learn so much. It's such a good kind of foundation to build on. You know, you learn your race craft in it. You learn, um, you know, how to keep your minimum speed up, especially if you start in something like, um, cadets or you know something fairly low speed where um you know if you have a rubbish exit out of corner it's going to kill you for the entire lap so you have to be really really kind of precise with everything that you do and um you know i enjoyed the experience of learning in carts um but because i'm quite tall i'm five foot ten and um as a kind of 10 year old i was quite tall as well and it ended up getting to the point where I was, I was basically overweight in the cart. So you have a minimum weight that the cart and driver should be. Um, and as is the norm with development, you know, um, young uh, boys tend to be a bit smaller until they get to a certain age and then they, they you know, shoot up, whereas girls develop a bit quicker. So we were always at a bit of a disadvantage, you know, kind of five or five or so kilograms overweight in the carts. And we did the last round of, or the last year that I raced in carts was in Super One, so the national championship and um, loved it. We ended up spending more money than we wanted to, uh, you know, family run team, or I say family, it was dad and me on race weekends. Um, and dad was like, what do you think about cars? And I was like, well, I am 14 dad, um, so I'm not sure. <laughs> And he's like, well, there's a you know, junior championship that you can race in, in a Citroen Saxo. And I was thinking, right, okay. And I'm like, but I, I don't really know how to drive. And he's like, you'll be fine, you'll learn. And I remember him like on the phone saying, yeah, right, okay, the Citroen Saxo. And I'm like, sat there and I'm like, okay, right, okay, right, we're going to be fine, we're going to be fine. And as soon as I jumped in this car on a track, I was like, this is awesome. And kind of from the off, I was fairly, you know, handy at it. Um, I just loved the feeling of things, you know, the car moving around and, um, you know, having to get the car, you know, the rear of the car to maybe slide a little bit on the way in just to get it to turn where I wanted it and stuff. And it just, I just loved every moment of it. And it was from that first time on a track in, in a car that I was like, this is awesome. Isn't it funny the way the world works and the way that it takes certain events to happen for you to realise, oh, this is actually my calling. This is where I want to be. What was the first track that you were at? Because it wouldn't have been Silverstone. No. So um, the first race I had was Donington Park. Um, And that's where I did my um, race licence test at Donington. And I remember I had an instructor called Stefan Hodgetts. um, So he's still around now he's still flat out with his instructor and a very good racer and um my dad was like right okay i'm gonna get him in sat next to you just for the morning before we do your your race license you know to make sure that you're okay and god i dread to think how awful i was <laughs> like you know but I, I passed my test and you know i went on from there and yeah thank for i don't think i scared stefan too much How hard is the test? Because I've not done it, I have to say. I've I've thought about it several times because I love driving, but I'm a bit old now. I'm a bit like, oh, so is it is it relatively easy to do? Um, yeah, it's just you've got to be predictable, you know, you can't drive around at snail's pace, you have got to have some speed about you. Um what are you saying, Abby? (laughs) I'm just 
just saying, you've got to put it out there. You've got to use the accelerator pedal fairly hard. Um, but the main thing is just to be consistent and be predictable. You know, if you do something out of the blue and the instructor's like, oh my God, you know, that's not going to be predictable for other people on the track. Um, so you're racing lines, you know, you've got to do the exact same line, lap after lap. Um, obviously, if you're overtaking someone, you have to do that safely. And equally, if someone's getting past you, you need to do that safely as well. Um, you know, breaking points exactly the same each time, just so that, you know, if the instructor sat there and, and you know, he or she knows that, you know, you're not going to kill them each corner and he's comfortable with what you're doing, um, then generally, you know, you'll pass. Um, it's not super harsh at the point where, you know, you've got to be as good as, as me or anything like that. It's just that we need to, if we were next to you on a grid, know that you'd be safe um, and we'd be safe. So that's all there is to it. Yeah, I think I think that license might be a way off for me. <laughs> Fine, I am 100% certain of that. <laughs> They'll sort you out. Well, I was going to ask, so obviously you, you drive, but you also instruct. How hard is it to be an instructor? Because you must at times be sitting there going, what are you doing? Your internal voice, you must have to control that a lot. Yeah, there's lots of things that go through your head at the time. Um, I think when I first qualified as an instructor, you know, I wanted to make everyone, you know, the next Lewis Hamilton, you know, I wanted them to, you know, why are you breaking there? You know, break later, you know, faster, faster. Um, and especially on retail days that Silverstone offer, like, you know, the Ferrari experience or Aston experience, that kind of stuff, you know, it is an experience. And ultimately these people are here to enjoy the car and enjoy the track and they're not here to be the next F1 driver. So, um, you know, I learned pretty quickly that, I was getting wound up more. Um, so now, you know, I'm just make people go as fast as they're comfortable with. Um, and if they, they don't get things, they don't get it. You know, it's, it's not the end of the world. Um, having said that, there are sometimes, you know, I just have to stare out the window and just be, it'll be over soon. You know? <laughs> Generally, it, it's an all right experience. So how does one go about becoming an instructor? Um, so you can do your ARDS license at um, various tracks around the UK. Um, I did mine at Silverstone and I would always advise people to go to Silverstone just because I think that they do it kind of the most professionally. Um, and, you know, I had a fantastic experience myself uh, doing it there. Um, my um, instructor when I did my ARDS license was Christian Baker and he is still there now, um, still today. And um, yeah, I, I spoke to him or when I saw him after lockdown and said, um, we were just having a bit of a catch up. And he was like, I knew, you know, when you sat next to me and we went out around the national, he was like, God, this girl's on it a little bit. Um, so, you know, it's nice that he has those, those nice thoughts as, as well from our experience. But um, yeah, so you basically, you can book it um, online. So I think you can actually book it on the Silverstone website um, or contact basically whoever it is um, at Silverstone to get involved. Um, they run several days throughout the year for instructors and you'll basically come down. Um, for example, if it was me that was taking you for your test, um, I'd drive for a bit and I'd want you to instruct me let's say you're doing your, your arts license so you'd instruct me um i'd do some random things that you're not expecting and see how you deal with it um and yeah that's as straightforward as that i mean it sounds like my idea of hell i'm not gonna lie i'm a terrible passenger now, <laughs> most of the people i speak to who are drivers are terrible passengers now you have to be a great driver but a great passenger presumably yeah i think as i get older i get i'm getting worse <laughs> I think when I was younger, I was like, yeah, but now I'm like, do you know what? I'm too old for this. I'm only 28. I'm not too old at all. I'm just being old and grumpy before my time. Well, that's why we love you because you have an air of cynicism about you <laughs> and it's not all fluff and fairy dust. It's when we talk to you, it's, it's real, isn't it? And you are a very real and genuine person despite the successes that you have had. Yeah, I just think, you know, I'm never. I probably come across maybe a little bit more blunt because I'm a little bit northern. Uh, <laughs> originally. Um, but, you know, I like to give people a rounded view of things. Um, you know, it's very easy, especially on social media, to see the glitz and the glam and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, life isn't like that. Uh, you know, there's, there are amazing highs, but also there can be some hard work and some, some tough blows to deal with as well. So, um, you know, I think it's important to share the full journey of things. Um, 
because ultimately, you know, people want to know the nitty gritty and the parts that they don't hear about usually. So um, I try and tell people that to a degree. Okay, so let's tackle the glitz and glamour first because yeah. you do have quite a showbiz lifestyle. Um, have you got any great stories about people you've had in your car that you have driven that you could share with us? Um, let me think. Put you on the spot now, haven't I? <laughs> yeah, I think there's some whoever I was with. So I have um, instructed Adrian Newey um, at a different circuit called, or a different event called Palmer Sport. Um, really, really nice guy. Um, good peddler as well. Good driver as well. Um, he comes down to the event with um, Jonathan Palmer, Martin Brundle, um, who I'll see with all the, the F1 kind of bods, if you like. Um, and yeah, so I've had the pleasure of instructing him. Made my life super easy um, because he, he takes instruction fantastically. You know, great pupil, um, a decent driver as well. Um, I haven't had the chance to instruct Jeremy Clarkson or anyone like that. Everyone always asks me, you know, is he a good passenger or, you know, have you had to give him any tips or anything? So um, that's on the bucket list to do at some point. Um, and I actually instructed Amy Winehouse's dad as well, which, yeah, random, random one there. But yeah, he was pretty cool as well. Nice guy, really nice chap to, to deal with. And it always helps if you're nice to your instructor, the instructor's always nice to you. So top tip so no swearing at your instructor and saying it's all their fault is that I what mean, you're telling me yeah, i don't mind that because every other word that i i say is usually a swear word um but yeah if it's not directed at me then that is probably better okay that's good to know always useful to know um and what about the realities i suppose of being um of being a racing driver yes you do the instruction and yes you know you make sure that you're at silverstone plenty to help them out it's not easy being a racing driver and a lot of people think deals fall into your lap because you are female, but what's the reality? Um, well, the reality is 18 years of solid hard work and um, there have been countless times where I'm like, do you know what? I've had enough of this, you know, I'm, I'm going to give up because um, you know, it's not just, you know, it's not because I'm a female that it, you struggle to get things. Motorsport is an extremely tough um, industry to be in. And, you know, it is very dependent on money um, and usually extortionate amounts of money, the higher up you go. Um, and it's difficult for anyone to get, get sponsorship. And um, that can be quite demoralizing at times. Um, you know, I spend hours and hours putting together proposals, um, you know, researching companies to see what their like values and ethos are and, you know, what their agenda is maybe for the next year or two and things they want to push and tailoring it to what I'm about and what I can offer and, you know, Abbey Eaton as a product. And, you know, I might spend like seven to 10 hours on a proposal for a company and I'll send it to them and maybe eight times out of 10, you don't hear anything back. And I would just love a thank you, but no thank you. You know, that's that's all, you know, that that I would appreciate. Um, and then you get the, you know, the two out of the 10 that are lovely people. And, you know, maybe one of them says thank you, but no thank you. And then the other one says yes. Um, but you have to send, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these things out. And usually it's right place, right time more than anything. And kind of um, who you know as opposed to what you know. Um, and yeah, it's not, it's not um, the most uh, rewarding of things to try and, and make happen um, because you look, it's almost like I, I describe it to people. Imagine you're um, a footballer and you spend hours and hours practicing, trying to be the best you can, putting all the graft in, all the, the, the hard work, and then you never get a game to play in because you never get the opportunity to play in that game. Um, and yeah, it just, it knocks your confidence a little bit. You know, you think, well, you know, I've been out, I've been lucky, I've won several championships, you know, whatever I jump in, I tend to be in the top three. Um, so then you start questioning me as a person and I'm like, you know, my results speak for themselves. So is it something with me that people, you know, don't like or, you know, is it something I need to look at to change? And I'm like, you know, I've come to the realisation now, you know, 18 years in that people have to support me for me and, um you know, if they want to change me into something else, then, you know, I'm probably not the right person for their kind of campaign, if you like. But 
I've had some amazing sponsors along the way so far. Um, you know, I've done some ex exciting things, some really cool things that you know I'm quite proud of. Um, so yeah, there's there's always a yin, yin and yang. Um, and me and my dad have this saying that motorsport is 95% a pain in the backside, but the 5% is absolute elation. And that 5%, you forget about the 95% hard work, you completely forget about it. It's enough to keep you coming back for more, isn't it? It is. Just at the moment where you're like, I've had enough, I'm going to give up. Someone says, I've got this little opportunity. What do you think? And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll give it another go. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's talk opportunities because there are three different ones I want to talk about. First of all, let's go with the obvious. Let's go with Grand Tour. Mm -hmm. How did that come about and how enjoyable was it, is it to do? Um, so it was kind of out the blue, really, with the Grand Tour. Um, I got an email uh, from the production company that just basically said, look, we want you to come down, just see what you like, see how you get on with the, the, the camera crew and production team. Uh, there's going to be some cars there for you to drive, so you know, jump in and go as fast as you can, basically. But they wouldn't tell me anything more than that. And you know, in my brain, I'm thinking, well, there's probably only one job that you know entitles doing this kind of stuff. So, um, all right, I'll give it my all and see what happens. Um, at that time, I wasn't actually doing any full-time racing. So like my mindset was like, I'm either going to be super fast or I'm going to be in a tree somewhere because that's what the Ebola drone, the track was like. There was no runoff whatsoever. Um, and yeah, went out and managed to kind of smash all the lap times that were set in the cars. And I just thought, right, okay, this is looking good. Let's see what, what happens next. Um, got invited down for another um, morning and this time it was some higher performance cars so to start off with it was like m3s and um honda civics like a mixture of front wheel drive rear wheel drive and all that stuff and then the second time was um like porsche 911 gc3s and bits and bobs like that so they just wanted to see what i was like you know thrown into something with a bit more horsepower and again did all right and um then they invited me down to the office in london and said look like we've got the american dude um that does the laps already, but we want to change it up. Do you want the job? And I was like, well, why not? Of course I do. <laughs> um, and then that's, that's how it came about. Amazing. I, not life changing though, I'm assuming. It's definitely offer, offered some opportunities. Um, you know, my last full race season was 2016. So, you know, since then I've, I've just kind of had guest drives in bits and bobs and I've been offered some really cool things to do. And I think it's probably um, on the back of the profile that I've kind of um, built from the Grand Tour. So, um, yeah, it's been an exciting thing to have on my CV and it has opened up a few doors. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say on it. <laughs> um next opportunity comes along w series um which must be a, a huge um i suppose at the time it was exciting <laughs> now it's just turned into this huge waiting game yeah um so initially um my thoughts on w series were um well they were negative towards it um for those people that don't know W series is the first um, female only single seat championship and it's fully funded. So um, you don't have to bring any money to it. Um, your accommodation and flights and everything are all taken care of as well. And there's a big prize fund at the end of it. So it's kind of unprecedented really having an opportunity like that in motorsport in general, never mind just solely for females. Um, and you know, throughout my whole career, I've, I've never really tried to push the female aspect too much because that's not what I'm about. You know, I'm there because I love the racing and, you know, I, I'm, that's all I want to do. Um, of course, you, it's a unique selling point that you, that you use to try and, you know, um, outsell yourself from your competitors. Um, but to me, it wasn't the important part. The important part was me being in the car and being in, in the front, front part of the grid. So... Um, when they announced that they were doing a female only championship in my brain, I was just like, you know, fantastic that this um, investment was being made in, in given into females in motorsport, you know, about time. Um, but in my brain, having a female only championship was just a bit of a gimmick. And um, there was that it's been done before, you know, there was Formula Woman back in the day, um, other bits and bobs that they were just a bit of a flop and they were a bit of a gimmick. And I was just worried that it was going to be another one of those. Um, so I made the conscious decision to 
just watch the first year. Um, you know, I was approached several times to, to go and do it. Um, but I'd actually worked super hard to get a DOI in Australia and, you know, I'd put two, three years of effort into doing that. So I was like, all right, I'm st- I know that this is here, but I'm, I'm concentrating on that. And also I'd never driven a single seater in my life. So it was something completely driv- uh, different to anything I'd ever driven. So it was going to be a bit of a route like this to go to W series. So I thought I'll wait and just see what happens and we'll go, you know, go again in 12 months. Um, Australian thing lasted, uh, a, a couple of months, um, ended up that the sponsor that was going to back me all year, um, decided to go into a different sport. Oh, yeah. uh, so that was frustrating. Um, so ended up coming back to England and then spent the rest of the year watching the girls racing in W series and, you know, the, the infrastructure that has been put around them is fantastic. The money that's been invested in them, again, is, is um, amazing. You know, the um, engineers, the, the team, all the personnel involved, it is, there's no expense spared and it has been done fantastically. And you can see that from, you know, the level of, of performance and the racing that the girls put, put out as well. So, um, yeah, kicked myself a little bit, um, you know, but I wouldn't, change it I don't think there's no well there's no point regretting you know not doing that first year now because yeah it is what it is um but thankfully they um, accepted my application for year two um did the assessment and got through to the the final 20 or the, the 20 drivers on the grid and then COVID happened <laughs> and so it was postponed to next year it's so tough isn't it It, I remember speaking to you just before lockdown and it was like come on game on you know this is going to be exciting this is your big break really um so the big break is on pause yeah yeah it's on pause I mean um you know there's gonna hopefully be some news soon um because we're nearing Christmas time now aren't we so um yeah the season will be upon us before we know it so yeah hopefully um some news very very shortly Uh, And the final thing I want to talk to you about is, of course, Silverstone, Um, because that's where you do cars. It's where you do bikes as well. You instruct and you go there and help them out. Just tell me why Silverstone is important to you and why other people should embrace it if maybe they haven't yet. So Silverstone to me is, um, well, it's the home of British motorsport. Um, you know it is something really special and when you go there on an F1 weekend it is just absolutely buzzing Um, you know it's it's a home from home for me Um, and Silverstone opened so many opportunities to people to have their first experience of things so you know for example they've got the single seater experience that they run Um, I always tell people to go and do it because it is you know trying to explain to people what it feels like being you know this far off the ground with no roof over you and you know how physical it is to drive some of the cars I think it's a fantastic experience and um, I for one had my first um, bike track day experience at Silverstone as well Um, so I'd only passed my bike test um, a couple of months previously and um, one of the girls at Silverstone rang up and said look do you want to come and do the um, Neil McKenzie masterclass with the Yamaha R1M and I was like, oh, well, yeah, like something I want to do because I want to get more comfortable on a bike. So you know, what I say to my car customers that are maybe a bit nervous is go and do a car track day. So I took my own advice and said yes to the bike track day. And um, it was an incredible day. Absolutely amazing. You know, I had the, a fantastic instructor. Um, you know, being on the other side and being the pupil, um, you know, I was like a sponge. I tried to absorb everything, every bit, bit of information he was giving me um and it's yeah they're always fantastic run days you know good turnout people behave themselves on silverstone track days as well um and as you say it's not just cars they care to do it's bikes they've got the single seaters they've got the drift stuff with caterham um yeah it's it's just an awesome place i love it and it's well i've moved down here so i must love it you I'm must to away from it now <laughs> that's amazing it's just within stone's throw um now i've been lucky enough to do a single seater experience there which i have to say one of the best experiences ever especially as i think i probably shouldn't say this but crofty spun just ahead of me and i was like yes yeah. got him yeah um, but if you were going to recommend to somebody who's starting out maybe to someone who's thinking oh christmas is around the corner and i've run out of things to give my other 
person in my life or my child or whatever it may be what would you think would be a good entry level a good starting thing to experience at silverstone um what have they got maybe the so they do um, like an m or oh, race car experience with the bmw m2s um and i know that they've got a little one one or say little the um the one series are still pretty the 140 um m sports are still pretty nippy but um yeah i think any of those are a decent kind of entry level to come in and just do you know five or six laps around the circuit um but even the stuff like ferraris and the aston martins you know they, they only go as fast as you want them to go um the instructor sat next to you we've got a brake pedal on our side um and we can you know generally we'll help you out as and where we can but if if you listen to the instructor you're not going to get yourself into any bother and, and you'll enjoy what you're doing see this is my biggest fault abby i never listen <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> It's, it's difficult to do and this is what I try and say to people is that you know it's you've almost got to take your your brain out and just pop it on the shelf for a bit because you know we're so used to driving on on the road that you know it's not that you don't listen you'll be listening but it, you'll be like my body like knows that this is what I should be doing on the road so and it's you can't break that kind of habit um you know you can't disconnect the two um and yeah it just takes a bit of practice that's all just a few more track days well, I'm perfectly willing and probably not quite able, but willing anyway, to do as many track days as you like. So that sounds good. Um, Abby, we've taken up lots of your time. I really appreciate you chatting to us. Um, we wish you the best of luck for 2021 and I hope that the year is kind to you and that you just go out to the W Series and are phenomenal. So good luck. Thank you. We'll see. It's going to be a learning year. Um, but yeah, if I can just get better each time I go out, then... That's all I want to do. We're all behind you. Abby, thank you so much for your time and we'll, we'll speak again soon. Cheers. Now, can you do me one favour and just say um, something along the lines of you're listening to the Silverstone podcast with me, Abby Eaton, yeah. or whatever you want. You're listening to the Silverstone podcast with me, Abby Eaton. Lovely. <laughs>